on Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve, take a lantern and cast your shadow onto the wall with lamplight. Whoever casts a headless shadow will die within the year. This is just one of a range of strange shadow superstitions, but where do they come from and why are they so important? Let's find out in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Cedric, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I do hope that you're well. We are on the final Saturday of July, so I do hope that July has been a little bit kinder to you than previous months. And also, where on earth is the summer going? But that's a side issue. I am going to basically jump straight into the topic this week because we do have a lot to get through in our final week of the folklore of intangible objects and we are looking at shadows this week and there's a whole range of superstitions, beliefs and legends and all sorts for us to get our teeth into this week. Now shadows do occupy a somewhat privileged position in regards to the human and if you think way back, obviously it's well beyond our personal lifetimes, but way back to the earliest versions of the human we would have seen shadows cast across the ground long before we ever saw reflections in water and then obviously a lot later glass. And shadows essentially show the existence of a thing because obviously for something to be real, it then obstructs light and therefore casts a shadow on the floor. So only an object with enough mass can actually cast a shadow. And the myth of drawing actually explains that a young woman captured her lover's likeness by drawing around his shadow cast on a wall. And this silhouette then became her keepsake when he had to go away for a time. So in this myth, the shadow and the love of a young woman essentially gave birth to art. And it's quite interesting because this idea of capturing silhouettes actually became quite fashionable for a time in earlier centuries. But we are going to focus, as I say, on the shadow and not the silhouette. Because shadows also act as a marker of both time and location and unlike a reflection they act as a companion in a way because they are always with you unlike a reflection and if you measure both the length and the direction of a shadow you can tell what time it is and also where in the world you are and obviously we just need to look at sundials to see how these combine sunlight and shadow to essentially place time under our control. Now shadows do have an intangible nature and a somewhat eternal attachment to us quite literally So it is hardly surprising that the shadow would have accrued a range of superstitions and beliefs. Obviously, for the matter of space, I am sticking to European beliefs and there won't be any philosophical discussions of the shadow in Plato's famous shadow metaphor, nor will I be looking at the shadow in its psychological sense popularised by C.G. Jung. And I'm sorry if that's why you came here, but honestly, this is a folklore podcast and I have to draw the line somewhere. So we're going to start off looking at the shadow as the soul. And for some, this is indeed what the shadow represents. So if you think about it, the shadow accompanies us everywhere that we go. It's with us from the day we're born until the day we die. And unlike the reflection, obviously, which always needs a surface in which to appear, this shadow is our faithful companion. And even if you feel like you're not casting a shadow because there's not enough light, you are technically still casting one, even if you can't see it. And unlike reflections, shadows are changeable of their own accord because they do stretch and shrink throughout the day, obviously based on the light source, where you are in relation to it and so on. So they do act as a point of regular instability in an apparently stable world. And they obviously are also intangible because you can't pick your shadow up, you can't touch it, you can't really measure it in any way. So with all of that in mind, what does that say about the human soul? And obviously, writers and artists both have tried to deal with this idea of the the shadow as the soul. And in 1814, Albert von Chamiso wrote Peter Schlemiel's Wundersame Geschichte, otherwise known as Peter Schlemiel's Miraculous Story. And in this novella, Peter Schlemiel sells his shadow to the devil himself. And he does this in exchange for a purse of gold that never runs out. So you can see why he would be tempted by such an item. And despite his newfound wealth, Schlemiel then finds himself shunned by other people. But why would this be? Well, E.H. Gombrich says since he casts no shadow, he has lost his place in the real world. 
So essentially, because Lee Mills sold his shadow, he's no longer considered as whole and people actually see him as being wrong. And you can sort of see that point because if a shadow is an indication that an object is real enough to block out light, then what does that say about an object with no shadow? Shalimul does try to buy his shadow back, but the devil then tries to strike a new bargain and he will give back Shalimul's shadow, but only if Shalimul agrees to hand over his soul upon his death. Shalimul refuses and luckily for him, he then ends up finding a pair of seven league boots and also discovers a whole range of new hobbies. So he basically lives out the rest of his life in isolation, but he has saved his soul in the process. Now, incidentally, there was also a belief that selling your soul meant you had no shadow, so perhaps people also shrank away from Schlemel in their assumption that his lack of a shadow meant that he'd sold his soul, which obviously in this case, he was very much trying to avoid doing. And one of the reasons why this idea took hold is that the shadow emerges as the double. And you might hear me talk about the double quite a lot. It is a concept that I am using in my PhD on horror films. And the double is actually a copy of the person, but not the literal person themselves. So reflections and fetches are also both examples of doubles. And there are loads of instances of the shadow within literature. And in these cases, it often acts as the double of the person. So it's essentially something that can stand in for them without it actually being them themselves. And it does reflect the belief in the shadow as being either the soul itself or a guardian spirit of the soul. And it's also a form of a copy in the way that a photocopy is a copy. So it references the original and it looks a lot like the original, but it can never actually truly be the original. Hence something being a pale shadow of itself. Now in Hans Christian Andersen's The Shadow, a scholar shadow actually frees itself and goes on to be successful in its own right. And it also manages to convince people that the real scholar is in fact its shadow. So the scholar then ends up in prison insisting he's the original, but everybody thinks he's a deluded shadow that thinks he's a real person. So it all goes to show that in some cases, the shadow actually gains a mind of its own and an identity of its own, and it goes off and has its own adventures. And this is because it's the double, therefore it essentially has all the characteristics of the person. Now, this did then lead us on to shadow superstitions, because as you can imagine, if you're then worried that your shadow might take on a mind of its own, you'd obviously have a range of beliefs about it. And obviously, I'm not going to look at the importance of the shadow to Groundhog Day, because we did cover that in the episode on weather law, if you're interested. But there are other superstitions that relate to the shadow. And Margaret Baker relates one that in Louisiana, when a willow grew large enough to cast a grave-sized shadow, a family member would die. So here you've got the link between a specific size of shadow and then the impending death of a family member. Valda Rorich relates a Romanian belief that if you inflicted harm on a person's shadow, the person would then go on to suffer the effects. And then adjacent to that belief is the one from Austria, Germany and the Slavic regions, which is related by Otto Rank in his 1925 groundbreaking study, The Double. And he explained that people would try to cast their shadow onto a wall with lamplight on either Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve, and then whoever cast a headless shadow would die within the year. Now, what's quite cool is this then obviously makes quite an interesting topic for a lot of art. And my favourite pre-Raphaelite, not that anyone asked, but there you go, you now know which one it is. William Holman Hunt actually plays with this idea in his painting, The Shadow of Death. And in this one, you've got Christ in his carpentry workshop and he's standing, he's essentially just stretching. But then he casts the shadow of a cross on the wall behind him because of the pose that he's in, which then prefigures his own death. So the shadow then becomes an omen of doom. And Mary's to his left, or his right, actually, which is on the left of the painting. And she's clearly noticed this behind him and looks suitably shocked. And if you weren't sure that shadows had anything to do with omens of death, Rank actually explained that stepping on your own shadow was an omen of impending death. And yet, not all shadows were created equal. A.H. Gombrich actually relates the belief that St. Peter's shadow could cure the sick. And in the Book of Acts, people actually bring their sick out into the street in the hope that the saint's shadow may fall on them. And this echoes the stories in which touching Paul's skin or the hem of Jesus' robe basically had healing properties as well. And it's interesting that it's Peter's shadow that carries the healing power if you've got this idea of the shadow actually being the soul, because obviously Peter's quite holy, so therefore that would make his shadow very holy indeed. And this leads us on to the idea of shadows as protectors. And Rorich relates an idea that the shadow is actually the guardian of the soul 
not the soul itself. And here, when death then comes to claim the soul, the shadow has to give its permission. So if it doesn't give permission, death can't take the soul. And I'm sure there's at least several novels could be written about this particular belief. And A.H. Gombrich then riffs on this theme, and he explains about the idea that the ancient Greeks thought that we actually only survived once we left the world of the living as a shade among other shades. And you sometimes find this in some mythology that the dead are referred to as shades, as in they're just shadows of their former selves. And in fact, in a lot of stories, far from being evil, the shadow actually becomes a force for good. And Rorich discusses Frederick Reuss's work, Opera Omnia Animatico Medico, and in it he explains that demons even fear shadows and that those humans protected by shadows are safe from demons. That does of course imply that some people don't have shadows and obviously we know that everybody does but by this logic even vampires fear shadows because shadows do have the power to do them quite real harm. Now in some stories vampires don't actually cast shadows because they have no soul which then echoes their lack of reflection which we looked at a couple of weeks ago in the episode about reflections but it doesn't explain the famous shot from fw murnau's 1922 classic nosferatu when it's essentially the shadow of nosferatu is moving up the stairs but in these particular stories which i must admit i quite like because of the fact that they do do something interesting with the shadow the protective shadows sit in the region between good and evil and it does get a little bit confusing because shadows can't enter the afterlife, only the soul can. So it does therefore mean that the two things must be separate because if your soul can enter the afterlife and your shadow kind of has to not, then they can't be the same thing. It isn't immediately clear what a shadow actually does when a person dies, but in some sources the shadow essentially hangs around waiting to attach itself to the next person who needs it. Now that in itself actually puts quite a new twist on Peter Pan and his shadow behaves independently of him until Wendy can stitch it in place. So in this case we have to ask is his shadow his double, his soul or his protector or a combination of all three. Now Veronica Chenoz explains that Pan becomes the protector of dead children on their journey to the afterlife and it is a little bit sad when you consider what the Lost Boys actually refers to. And here, Pan represents both eternal youth and the threat of premature death. And Wendy's restoration of his shadow basically helps to neutralise the sting of death. So when he's separated from his shadow, essentially, he's then separated from this protective force. But then once it's restored, he can then continue doing his job, essentially. And speaking of shadows as potential guardians, we are going to round out this episode with a discussion of the shadow people. And the shadow people are an interesting topic because of the fact that you've probably had that sensation of movement out the corner of your eye and then you look and you might see a shadowy figure sort of disappearing a little bit like a person. And far from that being simple shadow folklore, it's now gained other connotations and it has given rise to the idea of the shadow people. Now, what are they? Stories do differ with some people seeing red eyes in the shadow, other people can discern vague details and yet more get a feeling of foreboding or malice from them. Other people report less malevolence and they sense neutrality from the figures. Now, nobody really knows for sure what causes the phenomenon, but among other things, I found a whole range of explanations which include ghosts, aliens, demons, jinn, the embodiment of our psychological shadows, time travellers passing through our timeline, astral travellers and a figment of your imagination. But the thing is, though, the peripheral vision is designed to detect movement and it largely does it very well. What it doesn't do very well is details because that's not what it's for. It's simply to alert you to the fact that there is something either just behind or to the side of you which may or may not be a threat and it's moving. That's all it's for. So it doesn't do details very well which does explain the somewhat hazy nature of the report. And sceptics often take this lack of detail to mean that a lot of people are just seeing things. But that said, if say you're home alone in your living room and you're not expecting to see anyone, you're not expecting to see movement, and you're just sitting watching Bargain Hunt with your lunch, and you suddenly see something out the corner of your eye. It's really unlikely that your brain's going to project a person into an otherwise empty room, and it's particularly not going to project a person and a sense of foreboding if you're just sitting watching daytime TV while having your lunch or something. Like To me, that's where it starts to fall apart, that some of the stories don't necessarily support this idea that it's just people seeing things. 
And because there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tales about the shadow people. And interestingly, they're also apparently increasing in number. Now, there is an argument that we're just better at collecting reports in the internet age, but that doesn't mean that there weren't stories before the internet. We just don't have records of them. Now, I asked the followers of my Facebook page if they'd ever seen shadow people, and I got some interesting responses. One respondent said that she felt the beings were curious more than malevolent, and they largely, from what I could gather, seemed to have a tendency to peer into rooms or stare at things that may seem novel to them, almost like they'll stick their head round a door, see what's going in, and then and then disappear again. A few respondents noted catching one of them appearing to stand over something, like they were just curious as to what it was. Another respondent explained that they appear to be more present during periods of stress, and she noted that she would feel threatened and then compelled to look in a particular direction, but notably for no real reason. So the stress was in response to nothing rather than an obvious stressful factor. And one respondent would find that her pets would also react to the figures, displaying defensive or protective behaviours at seemingly nothing. And less psychically sensitive individuals in the room would notice that nothing was amiss, except the strong reaction of the animal, whereas the person who was more sensitive would have noticed movement or something in the vicinity. And I've always had a long-running thing ever since I started doing paranormal investigations that I'll always trust what what an animal is doing. Most animals generally don't start displaying defensive or aggressive behaviour at nothing. They usually need to have some kind of trigger. So I'm always quite keen to see stories that do involve what animals do, because also animals aren't going to put something on and they're not bound up by the ideas of doing things for attention or anything like that. So I tend to trust what animals are doing. But what also stuck out to me was a couple of the stories actually involved electronic equipment, such as radios or paranormal investigation gear. And in the stories involving the radio, one radio even turned off when the shadow actually reached it. And I'd be fascinated to know if anyone else has had any shadow people experiences around radios or televisions, because I'm always fascinated when electrical gear almost becomes not a conduit, but at least some kind of way of bridging that gap, as it were. And before you dismiss the shadow people too far out of hand, the figures have appeared during broad daylight and several of the people who responded had seen them just during the day around the house, sort of a propos of nothing. Yes, there were obviously quite a few who it was late at night, it was while they were driving, it was sort of between one and three, and we've talked about the witch now before. You know, there obviously are quite a lot where they're sort of particular times of day or when people are in bed and so on and I suppose most people might sort of question those but I I mean I'm not going to question anybody because someone's experience is someone's experience but I do think that the ones that happen during broad daylight are the really difficult ones to argue with because that's the time that you're least likely to invent something for the sake of it. Now, it is beyond the scope of this episode to say exactly what shadow people are. And to be honest, many people have tried to do so with way more evidence to hand than I have. But it is quite interesting that beings from another dimension, from another world, from the past, present, future, all of these things all at once would take the form of shadows and not, for example, reflections. Because if a shadow represents an object obscuring a light source, then what does that say about a shadow in an empty room? Now, have you ever seen any shadow people? Do please feel free to let me know. You can message me. I will actually drop the link to my Facebook page below if you'd rather message me through that. And you can see the thread itself and see people's responses. You'll know which one it is because the the photo is a picture of my shadow on my my garden path. Anyway, if you have seen any shadow people, do, do please let me know because I am quite interested in collecting people's experiences and actually sort of seeing if there are any common threads or seeing how people relate to them because most people it was either wholly negative or it just happened nobody mentioned like a really super positive sense of oh my god I felt like love and light and all like nobody said that so I want to have a look into this a little bit further so that is the end of this week's episode next month we're moving on to like folk remedies and the folklore of health and medicine and things like that and we are going to start with one of my favorite figures from Greek myth and then later Roman myth Asclepius I think he's quite useful to to speak about at a time such as this. And also I get to have a chat about this infamous 13th star sign with you all as well. So you can look forward to that. As ever, if you've got any recommendations or any requests, please do let me know. And I am going to be sending out the Patreon exclusive episode sometime over the weekend. So people who are subscribers can look forward to that. So I hope to see you soon. Have a lovely week ahead and cheerio.
Thank you for listening to this week's episode. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to subscribe using whichever podcast app it is that you prefer. If you do use iTunes, if you could leave me a review, that would be fab. Basically, it just means iTunes are more likely to recommend this to other people. And if you're interested in more folklore, please feel free to swing by my blog, which is www.icsedgwick.com. And that's Sedgwick spelled S-E-D-G-W-I-C-K. And you can find all of the links, images and other bits and pieces that hopefully you enjoy. So have an absolutely fab week ahead and I'll see you soon. Cheerio.